world and welcome back and today we're right back on the floppy drives and in the previous episode we left it at a little bit of a weird spot. I had got it mostly working but the stepper motor was a jittery chaotic nightmare. But when I took my scope probe and touched it on a specific pin it cleaned out and was perfectly smooth going back and forth. Remove the scope probe and it goes right back into sheer chaos. I was starting to go a little crazy. I was kind of pulling my hair out. Uh, I did need to take a break from it. I was starting to burn myself out on it a little bit, but I also just needed help. So I tossed it out to you guys and <laughs> y'all came out swinging with some excellent, excellent suggestions. Uh, I read every single comment. Unfortunately, I didn't have the time to reply to very many of them, but I read every single one. And by far and away, the Number one suggestion was to check the power supplies. And that's a really good idea because the Meanwell switch mode power supplies that I put in there have some very high frequency ripple. Now Meanwell specifies that ripple as being less than 100 millivolts and I actually measured it out as less than 50 millivolts, which is really excellent for a switch mode supply, but a linear supply has no ripple. So it was definitely worth testing. So I disconnected the Meanwell supplies and I pulled out the Finch power supply, which is a CDC made linear power supply specifically for powering the Finch drive and the floppy drives. It generates plus 24, plus five and minus five. Although the floppies don't use the minus five rail, but I knew that this would be just perfectly clean power going into it. So I plugged it in and didn't work. It didn't fix the problem, which is unfortunate. So it was a very excellent suggestion. Thank you to everybody that suggested the power supplies. It was something that I should have checked very early on, uh, but unfortunately that, that wasn't the issue that we were having. Uh, but it turns out that some commenters did actually nail the problem dead square on the head. I'm gonna uh, read off some names here because these guys nailed it perfectly. Uh, Russell, 256 byte RAM, ringing resonance, Stuart Taylor, uh, Trevor, Metaforest, Ham and Wine, uh, Mr. Kev Bo, Andy Gatso, uh, Marco Locker, not Mark Knopfler, uh, Guntram, and Tesla Kova. You guys, you hit it. You, you got it perfectly, which implies that it's working correctly now. And it is. I've got it sitting on the bench and it can move back and forth buttery smooth without me having to put a scope or an extra uh, little capacitor anywhere in the circuit, which is awesome. So let's hop over to the bench, take a look at what it is that I got wrong because, well, it wasn't the board's fault. It was 100% my fault. Uh, so we'll take a look at what I got wrong and then let's continue working on the floppies. Maybe we can get one of these plugged into the FFC and start running some extra tests today. Although I do still think the FFC has a problem because of that command buffer error that we got when we did the test on the Diag card. But the best way to know for sure is to make sure that the floppy is working perfectly. So let's hop over there and get started. All right, first things first, let's go ahead and just flip the power switch on. Our AC motor is spun up, the head loaded, and I'm just gonna push the button here and let's see if it moves smoothly. <laughs> Look at that, buttery smooth in and out motion and not an oscilloscope probe or an additional capacitor anywhere in sight. Now you may notice that my uh, HP 200 CD signal generator here is missing and that's because that was the problem. I was using that 200 CD signal generator to generate a sine wave and I cranked the amplitude up on it and I was thinking that if the rise time and fall time of the sine wave was fast enough, when that sine wave went into a 2N2222 NPN transistor, it would transition it from saturation to cutoff and back quick enough that we wouldn't get any messy edges. And when I looked at it on the scope, it looked like a clean square wave, but apparently it wasn't. So now I'm using a 555 timer to generate a proper square wave. Uh, now I don't have adjustable speed on it. I just set it to like 70 Hertz. I did put a little switch on here that would allow me to slow it way down. This knocks it down to about 20 Hertz. And yeah, you can see it steps very, very slow and you can actually see the pulses going. It's very cool, but uh, 70 Hertz is a much more realistic speed. 
The manual calls for anything less than a hundred hertz. So that's a pretty good balance. And well, I really want to see why that square wave was nasty. Cause like I said, on the scope, it looked like a good square wave. So I'm going to pull out another two in two, two, two transistor and my 200 CD oscillator. Uh, and I'm going to pull out the scope and let's take some shots and see if we can see the difference in the edges of the square wave being generated by the 555 and a square wave slash sine wave generated from our 200 CD. All right, I've got the uh, scope set up here. The yellow line is going to be the square wave coming off of our 555 timer. The uh, purple line here is going to be the square wave that we're getting from our signal generator. Now, the way I have the signal generator set up is that I have a sine wave coming out of it going into the base of the transistor. And then uh, there's a 330 ohm pull up resistor and the transistor will pull that resistor to ground. So it generates a square wave that way. Now I've got the amplitude cranked up pretty high on the signal generator here. So that transition should be pretty quick. So let's flip the power switch on and take a look at the square waves. And I've got the frequency set uh, pretty close, but you can see that the square waves look very, very similar. And actually when I saw this purple square wave here, uh, I thought that was going to be enough to get the drive to work correctly. But what we actually need to be looking at is the rise or fall time of the square wave. So I'm going to zoom way in here uh, and we're gonna do a little shot here and it may take me a second to get one that lines up correctly, but yeah, there we go. All right, so we can already see that the uh, 555 is pretty much a straight line up and down. It transitions almost immediately. But if we look at the 2 and 222, it has a bit of a slope to it. If we zoom in even more, we can see that slope is even more pronounced. And that slope is what is causing the problems. Because while it's in this transitional period here, it hits a point where the uh, chip that is receiving this signal doesn't know whether it's a logic high or a logic low. And that generates all sorts of chaos. And so right there, that was our problem the entire time. It was 100% my fault and the board seems to be working almost perfectly now. So the next step was to remove the PCB one more time so I could desolder the power reduction option jumper and uh, change it back to re-enable the option since we've replaced that 9602 that was in there uh, and then put it all back together. And well, here it is back together. I did give it a test with my uh, little test board here and the power reduction option is working perfectly. So that is awesome. And the fact that that 9602 is working tells me that the read circuit is probably working now as well, whereas it definitely wouldn't have been working before. Now, before I get to work on drive B here, and I, I do wanna try and get drive B together, but drive A seems to be mostly there, like 95% of the way there. So I wanna actually plug it back into the Centurion and see if if I can get some communication or something to happen between the two. But I need to adapt the pinout of the Centurion, which is the FFC card, to the pinout of the floppy here because they didn't match at all. But I had figured out the difference in the pinouts, so I made a little PCB and, uh, well, that's what this thing is, but I made some uh, pretty nasty mistakes on it. Um, I had to grind off a section of this lower PCB here, and I actually cut this upper one in reverse. Uh, I wanted the jumpers to face in and the copper to face out, and I got it completely backwards when I uh, cut it. So uh, I think this is gonna work though. So I'm just gonna plug this into the back of the floppy, and then uh, these pin headers on this side is where our 50 pin cable will plug in. And that should successfully adapt the floppy to the FFC card. So let's go ahead and plug this in and give it a shot. All right, with the uh, floppy drive plugged into the FFC, it's time to give this a test. So I'll flip on the main power here, uh, and then I will turn the Centurion itself on, turn the CRT on up here, that should be warming up. While the CRT is warming up, we'll turn the power on for the floppy here. Yeah, okay, so our AC motor is spinning. 
everything seems like it should be set up, so we're on our auxiliary tests here. We'll do uh, 07, the floppy command buffer test first. So 07, enter. All right, that one still fails. It fails 11 error, 12 error, command buffer error. That was exactly how it was failing before, but that's actually not that surprising because the command buffer is part of the FFC card. So if it failed the first time, changing the drive out's not gonna change that. It's gonna continue to fail because that's telling us there's a fault on the FFC card. Uh, but other tests might pass. So let's try the floppy seek test. That's 08, so 08, enter. <laughs> it's seeking. There we go, it's slowly pushing it out, all the way out. It loaded the head, and now it's coming back. It's seeking, it's actually seeking. So we have the FFC card from the Centurion controlling our floppy here, which means that my really terribly made adapter here actually works perfectly as well. So that means it's getting drive ready signal and all sorts of other very interesting stuff going on here. Uh, so it did a full cycle. Now I can't uh, exit out of this. If it's anything like the seek test for the Finch, I have to wait until it comes back to track zero to cancel out of it. So if I hold control C here, yeah. Yeah, there it goes. Okay, so it came all the way back to track zero, hit the track zero switch, sent track zero information to the FFC card that completed the full seek test, which was all the way out and all the way back. It passed and got me back to the menu here. That is awesome. All right, let's try the floppy retest, 09. Oh, I heard it load the head. Oh, all right. All right, so it says busy did not clear. It failed. But there's actually some really amazing information that we can tell from this because busy did not clear, control C to exit. That is the exact same failure mode as the read test for the Finch drive. So when we were playing with it many, many moons ago, we were able to pass the seek test on it, but we failed the read test. And the behavior with the floppy is identical. So that tells us that our Finch drive is probably totally okay. And we have a failure on the FFC card, which again is not surprising because we had the command buffer test fail. And there's a good chance that that command buffer test and the read test both failing are interrelated in some way, but that's awesome. All right, so we will uh, we'll reset here and let's do the, the seek test again, just to make sure that it's still working. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's really cool. All right, so we know that this floppy drive is, well, as far as we can test with the Centurion, 100% working. Uh, the next thing to try is to get drive B up to 100% working. I need to do some uh, rework on the PCB of it. I need to solder in some sockets, put some new chips in it, put it all back together. I'm gonna put the uh, stepper motor that was originally in this drive into that drive, get it together, and maybe, if we're lucky, we can get the seek test running on drive B2, which will tell me that both of our floppy drives are 100% working. So let's get to work.
All right, now that drive B is all back together, I want to give it a quick test, although the last time I tried testing it, it was totally dead. So I'll go ahead and flip the power on. I've got my uh, little breadboard hooked up with the step signal, and well, I can tell already that it's not good. The head is about midway through the travel, and it should be moving the head immediately. Uh, maybe if I need to close the door, no, nope, that's not doing anything. Uh, I can actually reach in here and push the track zero switch, and that's not working either. So it's exactly how it was before I started salvaging parts off of it. Uh, so it, it sounds like it's a unit select problem, maybe? Like, uh, maybe the unit select signal is not making it far enough into the system because that kind of gates everything. Uh, but I think the only way to really know for sure is to uh, get the scope out and start checking signals. And uh, maybe we can find what is causing the problem and I can get both of these going. Uh, so, well, I'm going to pull the scope out and get to work. All right, after a uh, full day of probing on the board here, I think I've found a problem. I don't know if it's the problem, but it is certainly a problem. This uh, LM339 right here has uh, four comparators on it, but one of them is being used for power on reset. And that's what uh, pin one here is that I've got the scope on. Uh, and right now the drive's off, so the scope is sitting at a low level. Now what should happen is when I turn the drive on, we should see this bump up to five volts uh, briefly, showing that the drive is in reset. That essentially uh, prevents it from reading, writing, or seeking the uh, head at all. Pretty much keeps the drive completely inert until the voltage levels and everything stabilizes. Then this signal will come low and allow the drive to start doing its thing. Uh, but if I flip the power on here, uh, we can see that the level goes high and stays high. It never comes low. So the PCB is held perpetually in reset. And, well, that's obviously not a great thing. Uh, so I checked the voltage levels of the inputs into this comparator for the uh, power on reset. And given the levels that they should be, this output should be pulled low. So I think we have a bad uh, comparator chip here, this 339. I'm going to uh, pull the board off and double check all the traces to make sure that we don't have a uh, short or something else going on but I'm fairly certain that this 339 is going uh, the way of the dodo. So we got some more desoldering work to do. All right, new 339 is in. The uh, old one is right here. I just put a socket in there and then put a uh, brand new chip in place. The scope is sitting on pin one, which is the output of our uh, comparator there, which is the uh, power on reset signal. So what we should see is we should see the signal go high and then after a set amount of time, it should come back down to low, at which point in time the drive should, uh, fingers crossed, be working. So let's flip the switch here and watch the level. Went high and then came low. All right. That's awesome. Uh, we saw it jump up and then come immediately back down. Uh, so the drive should be working. I'm going to push the button and we'll see if it seeks. Yeah, it's seeking the head in and out perfectly. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, it seems to be working. Let's uh, check the sector pulse and make sure that we're getting uh, proper sector pulses on the scope here. Uh, so I'll unplug my scope from you and we'll plug it into the sector line over here. Uh, and we might be a little fast here. I think I'm gonna need to slow it down. Yeah, there they are. Check it out, we've got the sector pulses showing up. So we're reading our sector pulses. We're uh, moving the head in and out perfectly. Uh, this drive is <laughs> now working, at least to the level of drive A. This uh, power on reset circuit here, this uh, 339 was absolutely dead. And the power on reset circuit is really interesting. Uh, looking at the schematic here, we can see that the output has essentially a voltage divider on it with uh, R90, R85, and then R84 here. And well, what really is confusing me, and maybe you guys can chime in on this, is the relationship of CR20 and uh, CR17. The way these diodes are laid out, 
uh, is a little weird to me. The erase inhibit line, because coming from a uh, 7405 inverter, and I, we just, we can't figure out why that's important. The best we can come up with is that when the erase inhibit is pulled low, the amount of time to charge C43 uh, is different, thereby uh, changing the amount of time that the circuit sits in power on reset. But uh, either way, it doesn't matter because this 339 is totally dead and we replaced it. So this drive should be working to the same level as drive A, which means that the next obvious uh, thing to test is to plug it into the Centurion and see if we can get the seek test passing on both drives. All right, I am so confident that drive B here is going to work plugged into the FFC that I actually went ahead and bolted it back to the uh, back plate here. Uh, also, I wanted my desk back. <laughs> uh, but I've got it plugged into the FFC. I've got the termination resistor in place. It should work. I think it's time to give it a test. So I'll flip the main power uh, strip on there. We'll go ahead and turn the machine on. Turn the uh, terminal on here. So while the terminal's warming up, we'll turn the power to the floppy drives on. And yeah, both AC motors are spinning. I can actually see the media of the disc spinning around as well. Uh, so the CRT has warmed up. Floppy seek test, that's the test we know works on drive A. So let's give it a test on drive B. That's gonna be zero 08. We'll hit enter and... <laughs> yes, yeah. It's, it's seeking correctly. So drive B is working as perfectly as drive A. That's awesome. Now, that means that we can now move further with uh, diagnosing the FFC card because that's the ultimate goal of getting these two drives going. Now, I do know that the drives are not aligned. Uh, even though I believe they're both working perfectly now, they aren't aligned to anything. But in order to align them properly, I need a CDC alignment disc, which obviously I don't have. So my plan is to focus on drive A, get the FFC repaired, and write something to drive A, then use that disc to align drive B. They won't be aligned to anything else out in the world, but I have never seen any data for a Centurion on a floppy disk anyways, so I'm not really too worried about that. But they will be aligned to each other, which means I should be able to swap data between the two. But I can't get that alignment done until I can write some data to the drives, and well, I want to do that with the Centurion, which means we need to start working on the FFC card. And that's what we're going to start working on in the very next episode. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching. I am just over the moon with uh, the fact that both of these drives are finally working. It took me a little bit longer than I was expecting. Uh, but thank you guys so much, and I hope to see you in the next episode.